Hello, 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 and welcome to the December live stream Q&A, the last one of the year 2021. We're going to close it um, with a live stream Q&A followed by a holiday party for patrons. So if you are a patron, if you support me on Patreon, you get to join in about an hour and a half. We're going to be starting a VR and desktop web-based VR um, holiday party. Uh, and you can join me there. Uh, we'll chat about all things weird and uh, end the year with a bit of a party. But in the meantime, let's get to our live stream Q&A. Uh, today's code is December Live Q&A or December Live QA. And you can enter that code on slido.com in order to ask me questions. Although uh, we do have quite a few questions today. I have to give you a bit of a warning and uh, an apology. Um, I'm suffering from a migraine today, so my energy is a bit low and my brain is a bit sluggish. I may spend more time than usual just hanging around in the chat and uh, chatting with you live um, and less time answering complicated technical questions and trying to make my brain work. So we'll see how it goes, though. We'll have fun either way. So thank you all for joining. I see lots of uh, my favorite people in the chat who join week in week out thank you for all of your support and uh welcome welcome let me know if you can uh if you can hear me okay uh if you can see well if you can see my picture um that's all you can see and uh, let's get started our first question comes from mike what are three things you're most optimistic in Bitcoin for 2022? And what are the three things you most concern you in Bitcoin for 2022? Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you too, Mike. Thank you so much for asking. All right, let's see. I guess uh, first is I'm looking forward to seeing implementations of Taproot rollout to wallets. So pay to Taproot or P2TR. Uh, this is based on the introduction of the taproot script type and package of changes that were uh, activated in November and are now par part of the Bitcoin mainnet. Now, these have not yet rolled out to most wallets, uh, but I, I do hope to see those implemented. I'm also looking forward to seeing what other capabilities people will implement based on Taproot. Uh, it offers some very interesting uh, capabilities, especially with uh, uh, script trees or mast. Um, and we'll see with that. I know one of the projects that's going to be uh, implementing things based on Schnorr signatures and Taproot is going to be the Lightning Network. And so one of the, the second thing I'm most optimistic for in Bitcoin for 2022 is seeing uh, the implementation of uh, uh, point time lock contracts on the Lightning Network that will use uh, Schnorr signatures, adapter signatures, that will improve privacy on the Lightning Network, as well as um, simplify the protocol. Um, so that's a, another thing I'm, I'm looking forward to. The third thing I'm optimistic about, uh, surprisingly enough, and you probably don't hear me talking about this too often, is mining. Um, China banned mining. And I think as of today, we're almost back at the hash rate uh, for the Bitcoin network before China banned mining. So basically mining bounced back, but it bounced back based on a new, if you like, industrial base of mining outside of China. And here's the thing. This is going to have a positive environmental impact. The, the truth is that one of the problems with the mining being concentrated in China, apart from the fact that it, it kept being used as a scare tactic to tell people that China could control Bitcoin, uh, was also the fact that uh, China produces a significant part of its power with coal-based factories that burn coal. And that adds a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere, a lot of uh, pollution, but a lot of uh, climate change gas. And so the hash rate we've now reached again, this time I expect we're going to see has a much lower environmental impact because um, this is based on mining that's happening in North America and in other places that have fewer uh, coal-fired electricity plants, which means that 
the foundation of Bitcoin mining is now on much more sustainable energy and less polluting energy. So those are the three things I'm optimistic about. Um, the three things I'm concerned about, well, first of all, is the possibility of a whole scale ban of cryptocurrency and especially Bitcoin in India. I think, uh, I think we're going to see that in 2022. Uh, the Indian government has been moving in that direction, and, and I expect we will see that. It's very, very disappointing. And I think it does an enormous disservice to you know, a billion and a half people who, who really need uh, a stable, independent currency that is outside of the control of the government. Um, you know, when your country bans Bitcoin, that's when you need it the most. And I think we're going to see it in India. We might even see it in China. And, and both of these moves are coinciding with the second thing that concerns me for 2022, and that is the emergence of central bank digital currencies. These are the um, fake cryptocurrencies that are pretending to be crypto, that are trying to do the thing that cryptocurrencies do, and specifically the thing that Bitcoin does, um, but don't. They just pretend. And so... Uh, these central bank digital currencies that are centralized surveillance uh, mechanisms without inflation protection, without uh, monetary policies, completely centralized and under the control of a central bank. Um, worse than traditional fiat currencies because they add a layer of draconian surveillance. I think we're going to see that. And it goes hand in hand with a ban on Bitcoin. So both India and China are planning central bank digital currencies um, very aggressively and simultaneously planning uh, to possibly ban Bitcoin at the same time. Now, the third thing I'm concerned about for 2022 is, um, surprisingly enough, exchange-traded funds. Uh, I think there, there's a lot of people in the Bitcoin industry who are cheering the entrance of um, Wall Street funds and um, investor money in the form of exchange traded funds uh, because it gives opportunity for more people to hold Bitcoin. But really all it does is it gives more people opportunity to be exposed to the price fluctuation without having any participation in the system or control over their keys and ultimately gives a lot of power and control to those who run the ETFs on behalf of their customers. And I think that's a negative thing. Um, I, I don't wanna see any more investment bankers in Bitcoin. Um, the ideal number is zero. Uh, we are well past that ideal number. And um, it it makes me nauseated uh, that the, the finance bros have arrived in such force. And really, you see that. You see that in the tone and uh, nature of the discussions around Bitcoin that have been happening for the past two years. And we see that in every run-up and every bull run. Um, the, the nature of the discussion changes from technology, decentralization, freedom, openness, open source, um, empowering the other six billion, providing opportunities uh, for those who have none, um, to basically, will the finance bros like us enough to make us rich so um, we don't have to worry about equality, freedom, and openness. We just have to make sure we're on the right side of a closed, uh, oppressive, exploitative system of finance. Uh, we can be on the rich side of that. And that, that nauseates me, honestly. So those are the three things I'm least looking forward to in 2022. Um, ultimately, though, even those things, they don't really concern me about Bitcoin. They just concern me about the state of the world. Bitcoin will continue to do what it does. TikTok, new block. It will continue to be outside of the control and unstoppable, just like it's always been. All right, let's see what's happening. I see uh, lots of good friends in the chat. Um, and thank you for your, for your good wishes. Um, yeah, welcome, welcome all. I hope you're having uh, a lot of fun. I hope you're spending time with family this uh, holiday season. I certainly am. And uh, let's go to the next question. Walter asks, does quantum computing pose a risk to Bitcoin? No. Oh, wait, you want me to elaborate? Okay. Walter asks, does quantum computing pose a risk to Bitcoin? No. Um, 
But why not? Uh, primarily because quantum computing really affects um, the types of cryptographic algorithms uh, that involve the discrete logarithm problem and things like that, not the hashing algorithm. And so, yes, it can affect ECDSA and some of the other cryptographic algorithms used in Bitcoin, but mostly ECDSA. And interestingly enough, 2021 is the year where we demonstrated in practice that we can upgrade the and introduce a new signing algorithm and did so in, in pretty fast activation time. All in all, about six months uh, for the activation. We could do it even faster, I think, if there was a need to do it. So uh, I, I don't think quantum computing threatens Bitcoin. Uh, I've said so before. And there's a lot of pushback in that opinion. I think it's uh, it's controversial, especially I, I get a lot of pushback, honestly, from uh, people who support cryptocurrencies that claim to be quantum proof um, and are currently solving a problem we don't have um, while not solving problems we do have, um, you know, so uh, I'm, I'm not surprised that that's a controversial opinion. Speaking of cryptographic algorithms, PM asks, is it fair to assume that Bitcoin can only be as secure as its cryptographic foundations? SHA-256, CCDSA, RIPE, MD-160, what happens if a vulnerability is found in one of these algorithms? Well, again, to my previous uh, answer, not much happens. Uh, the really difficult one to change is SHA-256. That one is difficult to change. And the reason it's difficult to change is because the investment in industrial scale ASIC mining um, by miners will create enormous resistance to changing that algorithm. But of course, if that algorithm is broken and there's a need to change it, then I don't really see that resistance lasting very much. So the economic interest will override the mining interest pretty, pretty quickly. Um, ECDSA, the elliptic curve digital signing algorithm, which is um, the foundation of Bitcoin digital signatures. Well, we already introduced a new form of digital signatures called Schnorr signatures with the introduction of Taproot this year. And so now the two run in parallel. If there was a bug in ECDSA, we could stop using it and just use Schnorr instead. RIPEMD160 isn't used as much anymore. Um, RIPEMD160 is used in old style Bitcoin addresses, uh, legacy Bitcoin addresses, three addresses and one addresses, um, but it's not uh, used in um, native SegWit and Betch32 addresses. So. Um, those use, if I remember correctly, I might be wrong about this, but they use SHA-256 SHA now. So that's been mostly deprecated. And, and again, these things can be changed. So Bitcoin is a system. It's a collection of technologies. And as it is a system, it's, it's fairly modular. Uh, now, these changes are not easy. Uh, don't get me wrong. I'm not um, pretending that these are easy. They're not easy, and you always have the challenge that if there are bugs that compromise the security of existing funds, um, then funds that haven't been moved for a long time or where keys have been lost may suddenly become accessible to attackers, and, and that could be problematic. But at the same time, we can upgrade these algorithms, um, and we can upgrade them in a variety of ways. So uh, I don't necessarily worry about problems that... Uh, that are so far into the future. Um, and these algorithms are plenty good for now and very, very strong. Anonymous asks, how should I secure my non-fungible tokens? Uh, can I move them to my own hardware wallet? Yes, yes, you can. So uh, just a, a brief reminder here, uh, wallets hold keys, not funds, uh, or tokens or non-fungible tokens, they hold keys. And non-fungible tokens, just like other forms of tokens and funds, are controlled by keys and the ability to produce digital signatures with those keys from your hardware wallets. And so if you have a hardware wallet and you have, let's say, an NFT on Ethereum, 
what gives you ownership of that NFT is a specific Ethereum address that you control the private key to that controls that NFT, that is registered as the owner of that NFT. The same thing applies to ENS domains and contracts and various other um, Ethereum activities. Basically, uh, Ethereum control is achieved very similar to Bitcoin through the use of externally operated accounts in the form of private keys. And so if those private keys are on a hardware wallet, then control over that NFT is controlled by the hardware wallet. So yes, you can do that. And you can do it with the same standards, um, 12 word mnemonic phrases. Um, and you can even have uh, not just NFTs, tokens, Ethereum, but also Bitcoin and a dozen other cryptocurrencies on the same seed in different branches of the hierarchical deterministic wallet tree of keys. And you can simultaneously control all of these different cryptocurrencies, tokens, and assets um, off that single hardware wallet. So, yes. Um, are there proprietary NFT platforms where you can't move the NFTs? Yes, uh, there are. And there's also NFT platforms that use smart contracts to uh, introduce various uh, controls and capabilities to NFTs. Like, for example, um, if you're using, let's say, the OpenSea NFT platform, the smart contracts of those NFTs allow you to um, implement a royalty scheme so that after you sell an NFT, um, you continue to earn royalties in second sale, third sale, fourth sale, subsequent sales, which is you know an enormously powerful feature um, that gives the artist um, the ability to continue to earn royalties after the first sale. Um, that's because of it's a smart contract that has these capabilities. Um, but of course, the other thing it also does is it pays a commission to OpenSea every time you do a transaction with that NFT and it changes ownership. Um, so every sale um, involves a commission to OpenSea, the platform, as well as royalties back to the artist. So now this isn't, however, a custodial platform. So just because um, it's non-custodial doesn't mean that there aren't any controls that are implemented. So the controls are implemented by the smart contract. The smart contract uh, controls the NFT, but you have certain capabilities as specified in the smart contract by presenting your keys um, to control that NFT, for example, selling it. All right, let's see. Um, how much fun are we having on a scale of 1 to 10? And I'm just delaying because my laptop went to sleep and uh, screen saved me out of the chat, so I can't actually see what you're saying. So it's going to take me a second. Oh, there we are. I'm back. I'm back. Good stuff. Very good. I can see uh, some of the YouTube members are currently burning fiat uh, using our latest emoji. Um, and, you know, given current rates of inflation, it uh, may uh, very well uh, become useful as fuel at the correct price and value rate in the near future. By the way, um, when we pick out the emojis, um, the design is made by one of the Antonop team, Erica, who does fantastic designs, but the whole team has input into these. This one we actually put up to a vote. So we had three new designs for emojis and patrons and YouTube members uh, voted on which one would be the new emoji. Now, these are world-class perks, people. World-class perks. I mean, being able to vote and choose between three emojis that you can only use in a single chat on a single YouTube channel. Um, <laughs> okay, okay. It's not that serious, but it's fun. It is fun. And uh, we, we do get to enjoy these little things. Next question comes from Bernard. 
Before signing a transaction, hardware wallets let you verify the address and amount to make sure nothing fishy is going on. How paranoid should I be when checking if the address is in fact correct? Do I have to compare every single character? The, the short answer is no. You don't have to compare every single character. Um, you can if you want to. And I would basically use a sliding scale based on how upset I would be if I got it wrong. So if I would be like, oh, bummer, I didn't check the address carefully. Some malware introduced a, an address into my clipboard and when I pasted it, it was slightly different. Um, very sophisticated attacker stole $10 of mine. Oh, boo-hoo. Well, maybe I don't check too many characters if it's that kind of amount. If it's like, well, I just lost my entire kid's college funds um, because some sophisticated attacker introduced uh, an address that was very similar to the one I expected. And you know, it's difficult to do that. And keep in mind, um, not only would an attacker have to compromise uh, the computer that you're working on and introduce some kind of Trojan into the clipboard, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, yes, that's possible. Uh, not easy, but it's, it's doable. It's, and it's been done, um, especially on Windows platforms. And basically replace addresses in your clipboard. But, um, or in the presentation of a website. Yeah, sure. Um, but now, now think about... Um, that, that would almost certainly involve doing it in near real time. And so you can make a little Trojan like that that just substitutes with another address that belongs to the attacker, but how similar can you make it to the address you're actually using? In, in order to make it similar, you'd have to read the address you're actually trying to send to and replace it with one that looks similar. And looks similar means you have to find another private key that when hashed produces the same address. And that's a process similar to mining. It's, it's intensive. It's how we produce vanity addresses. So there are certain circumstances where that becomes a concern. So for example, let's say you're doing a fundraiser, um, like I did many years ago uh, for this chap, Dorian Nakamoto. Um, and I wanted to make sure that it was difficult for people to replace my address. So I made a vanity address that started with one Dorian. It was a legacy Bitcoin address. Um, and it took me several hours of mining that address to find one that matched that pattern so that it started with a specific series of characters. And that made it difficult for people to replace the address without it being noticeable. Now, they could mine a slightly longer one um, and replace it, also find one that started with that string. Um, but that would require more computing on their time. Now, you can't do that in real time. That, that's something you only need to be concerned about if you have a static address that you're trying to replace. Unless you have a static address, if you're just simply, hey, grab an address for your wallet, I'm going to send some money to it, or generate a new address on the exchange, I'm going to deposit some money to it. Um, really, the chance of that address matching any digits as the one... Um, you paste it in your clipboard is pretty much zero. So um, I, I usually just check the first four and the last four. Uh, the first four, because those are easy to check at the beginning of the string, and the last four, because in several address formats, the last four are part of the checksum. Uh, where the address has a checksum. Um, so uh, if if I check the first four, the last four, easy to read on the screen, that gives me enough confidence. And, and that has given me enough confidence to, to send fairly large amounts. Now, if I was doing a transaction where I was sending, I don't know, my college fund uh, for my kid or, some, or buying a house or something like that, um, yeah, I, I check the whole address. Like I got 30 seconds. Uh, I got 30 seconds and I don't have another college fund. So it's a risk-based sliding scale. But for your everyday transaction, check a few characters at the beginning of the end and you're good enough to go. The main thing I would check when I'm looking at my wallet is the amounts, not the addresses. The addresses are fairly difficult to replace. Um, changing the transaction so that it sends a, a bigger amount to a different address, that's a problem. Um, that's where you start allowing someone to drain um, your cold storage effectively or your hardware wallet. So I would more carefully check the amounts and make sure they, they look good.
All right, let me uh, drink some water, check in the chat. Uh, things are very quiet tonight. All right, let me tell you about a few things that are happening soon. Let's see. First of all, as I mentioned earlier, about uh, 30 minutes after the end of this live stream, um, so just about an hour from now, we're going to be doing a, a VR holiday party for patrons. Uh, we're using a platform that can be accessed using uh, WebVR, so you can access it with any desktop um, with like a Mozilla browser. Um, or you can access it with a, uh, any VR platform. So whether you have a VR headset or not, you're welcome to join the holiday party. If you're a patron, um, join and come and see us in VR. If you're not a patron, well, you've got an hour. Hurry up, buddy. So that's one thing I wanted to tell you. The other thing I want to do is is give out some thanks to the people who make it possible, who made it possible for... Um, for us to make it another year and to continue to produce what I hope you find is uh, good quality neutral content and um, uh, deliver that in, in more languages and more places to more people than ever before. Um, so let me just briefly say some thanks. First of all, uh, thank you to the YouTube members and subscribers. Uh, we've actually turned YouTube into um, a, a nice little platform, a nice little community where we have quite a lot of interaction and feedback, uh, lots of regulars in the chat. We're playing with the emojis. It's been, it's been great fun. So thank you to all of those who have decided to do a monthly subscription on YouTube and uh, get all of the special emojis. My second thanks is to the, the team that makes the magic happen. Um, so uh, I couldn't do this without uh, several people who um, work full-time jobs in order to make this uh, educational mission a reality. Uh, and, and not just uh, a reality, but also a fun reality. And, you know, my, my team has creativity and passion and design uh, skills, and they make everything fun and make so many beautiful things that we get to enjoy and share with everyone. And, and finally, let me thank um, the patrons who decided this month to um, have their names included. This is an opt-in service, of course. So those who want to... Um, include their names. So uh, thank you to all of you who support me on Patreon. More than uh, 850 uh, community members. And specifically, thank you, Anita Posh, Carlos M, Dean Papas, Demosthenes, Enrico, Frank M, Giovanni, H3, It's the Barami, JKP, Karen and Cali, Lucia, aka Dancing Crypto, Mark in Memory of John, Mike Carson, Mike Wisend, Niraj Badaya, Outback Trader, Outlier Canada, Poggy Polino, Raphael Cislack, Richard Taylor, Slush, Sven Sommer, The Goddess Aris, Wackpack, Yes to Crypto, and Zikas. Now you will probably recognize several of these names not only from the questions where um, many of these regular members have been asking great questions, but also from the chat. So say hi in the chat. Thank you, thank you so much. All right, let's uh, let's go back to questions. Next question comes from Anonymous. For an existing uncompromised BIP39 wallet, when deciding to use a passphrase, would you add it and move funds or would you first create a new mnemonic phrase? So some terminology clarification for all of the viewers. A BIP39 wallet is a wallet that uses a 12 to 24 uh, English word mnemonic phrase as its backup. So the BIP39 standard specifies the mnemonic phrase um, backup scheme. And um, almost all wallets nowadays are BIP39 compatible, interoperable, and it's a, it's a very useful standard um, for making backups. 
Now, one of the features uh, BIP39 has is it has an optional passphrase that you can add. Uh, some vendors have called this the 25th word, which is a terrible name um, because it's not a word. It can be a whole phrase. It could be whatever you want. Um, but it's a, it's a second optional passphrase. Uh, in addition to the 12 words, you need this passphrase in order to recover the funds. And of course, you have to back up the passphrase too. Now, the question here is if it's uncompromised, meaning that uh, the person asking this question is assuming that the mnemonic phrase, the seed phrase, the 12 words, haven't been compromised. They've been stored securely. Nobody's seen them. It's still a good system. But they want to add this extra level of security, the second factor. Can they do so without generating a new mnemonic phrase? And I would say yes, absolutely. In fact, um, given how complex, difficult um, it is to not only... It's, it's not difficult to generate a new mnemonic phrase, but you have to back it up on durable media, preferably etch it in steel or something that doesn't burn, melt, or smudge um, with exposure to elements. And then you have to store at least two copies um, in a secure location that you physically control access to. And do you have many of those? And then when you do that, if you generated the new mnemonic phrase, what would you do with the old one? Because I would, I would be too scared to delete it forever. I would probably keep it around just in case there's a fork or an airdrop or something, or I forget a, a branch of the keys or there's some extra money in there that I, whatever, I'm not going to delete it. So I'm going to end up having to keep both. Well, just keep the first one. Don't make a new one and add a passphrase and then move the funds from the unpassphrase um, protected side to the passphrase protected side of that same mnemonic phrase. That's how I would do it. And of course, test first, send a small amount um, just to make sure you've typed the passphrase correctly. Um, because remember, there is no correct or incorrect passphrase. Every possible passphrase you can type will lead to a different set of keys. If you mistype the passphrase, grab an address, send the money, and then go and try to find it again and discover that you had mistyped it, and now you don't know which mistyping gets you to your money. So always test. Send a small amount first, back out, go back in, recover it, and make sure it's still there. Um, repeat the process so that you are confident that you can access the funds and then only then send the rest of the money. Oh, interestingly enough, this uh, live stream was actually unlisted on YouTube. Uh, and not public. Uh, and as a result, not many people found it, uh, which is why we only have um, about a dozen people. 25 people on this live stream. Oh, well, I guess it's a super duper exclusive in a circle, all of the Friends United um, live stream for now. And we're not going to change it to public now uh, and get a whole bunch of latecomers to the party. Because quite honestly, if something goes wrong and it glitches and we lose the 25 people we've already got here, uh, that would kind of suck. Um, so I'm just going to leave it like that. And this this one's going to be a little one. Uh, we're not going to have that many people live, but that's okay. That's okay. Quality over quantity. Next question comes from Lucia. Hey, Lucia. Um, hi, Andreas. Thanks as always for your excellent work. Thank you, Lucia. What's your opinion on the upcoming El Salvador Bitcoin volcano bond? Um, I'm skeptical. Let's, let's go into it a tiny bit. So what is the Bitcoin volcano bond? It is a billion dollar bond issuance that El Salvador is going to do. And it's going to use about half the bond, I believe, to buy Bitcoin and the other half to fund the development of Bitcoin-related city infrastructure in a specific area in El Salvador. And part of the idea here is that uh, based on the sound money properties and potentially appreciating future value of Bitcoin over the 10 years that this bond will be valid, 
um, investors will get uh, a minimum return of, I think, six and a half percent, and then potentially bigger returns if the proceeds from selling uh, the Bitcoin after year six um, generate bigger returns. So, I mean, it's a it's a pretty audacious plan, and um, I, I'm I'm more interested, honestly, in how it's received by kind of traditional finance people because because this is a bond and it's going to be listed in the bond markets and as a result the rating agencies are going to go in and they're going to rate it right now they rate el salvador's sovereign uh bonds their treasury bonds if you like um as almost junk rating because um they consider el salvador's credit worthiness to be pretty low I wonder if that changes with Bitcoin. I, I wouldn't be surprised if um, they rate the Bitcoin bond as junk also because they consider it super risky or they don't understand it or both. But, uh, huh. well, let's see. It's going to be an interesting experiment. It's, it's not a very risky experiment for El Salvador because, um, you know, the... They issue the bonds if, if they get the money and they use it to buy Bitcoin. And uh, it's uh, wor worst case, they have to pay six and a half percent interest uh, and eat into their dollar reserves. It's not a huge amount. It's a relatively small amount. I mean, a billion dollars is a lot of money, but not for a sovereign, not for a nation state. Uh, it's not uh, a huge amount of, uh, of debt. So it's an interesting experiment. And one that no doubt will be replicated and copied by other countries. Next question comes from Enrico Chain Analysis. Recently announced their KYT compliance software added support for the Lightning Network. Lightning Network greatly improves privacy, although not perfect. Do you think surveillance companies have some teeth to bite here, or it's just fuss? All right. Well, first of all, let's get our terminology uh, correct. KYT. Uh, that sounds like a variation of KYC, which stands for Know Your Customer. Um, I believe Chainalysis means Know Your Transaction. Um, maybe uh, we can find other definitions for it. Uh, for example, know your tyrant. What do you think KYTs should stand for? I'm always a big fan of KYB, which is know your banker. Specifically, you should always know if your banker is funding war criminals, dictators, uh, torture chambers, and death squads in various third world countries, or even in your own country. That's know your banker. Uh, of course, there is no know your banker regulation, um, but that should be uh, the customer's responsibility. KYT, know your transaction. Um, so I'm... I'm not surprised that they're trying to dip into the Lightning Network. And of course, they, they will be able to do some analysis, some statistical analysis, using information on the funding transaction, using correlation between open and closed transactions on the Bitcoin blockchain and channels and known nodes and transactions that they've seen. Yeah, sure, they'll be able to do that. Um, how effective is it? I mean... Honestly, I think it's mostly fig leaf. Uh, a lot of these regulations are... Uh, they're another favorite acronym of mine, which is CYA, which is cover your ass. Uh, and it's mostly about the regulatory uh, compliance people within various businesses that want to adopt a new technology, covering their ass sufficiently and saying, but, you know, we have, um, we have this and uh, we're trying. We're not perfect, but we're trying. I don't think it's going to be very effective. The Lightning Network really, really does significantly improve privacy over Bitcoin. And again, you know, all of these, all of these uh, regulatory compliance schemes, um, do they stop criminals? That, that's a real question we should be asking. Do they stop criminals? Uh, and at what cost? 
And the, the answer is really simple. No, they don't stop criminals. Uh, criminals mostly use control of banking licenses and banks themselves to do their money laundering uh, at massive scale using the US dollar, uh, oil proceeds and other mainstream commodities to do their money laundering. And they get caught, get a f small fine and repeat. Um, what this does effectively is it messes up the lives of little people who don't really matter to these regulatory entities. So um, not only do these not stop criminals, uh, they only um, affect the lives of those who do not have much power. Um, but ultimately, uh, they're, they're ineffective. So uh, I, I think they're going to be even less effective than they have been in the Bitcoin space. But, you know, this is an adversarial process. Let them try their KYT. And that is a very good incentive to implement things like point time lock contracts, PTLCs and Lightning that break the routing chain in such a way that you can't do correlation based on hash, payment hash. Uh, so that's one thing we can do and, and continue to improve. You know, we have to continue to improve privacy. And the trick with all of these things is, can we implement technology faster than surveillance companies like Chainalysis can implement um, surveillance technology and faster than regulators can write regulation? Um, by the way, from a moral perspective, if you work in technology, um, you should be uh, thinking hard about what companies you're willing to work with. As far as I'm concerned, uh, building technology uh, for companies like Chainalysis is not at all different than working for a weapons manufacturer um, uh, or any of the organizations that are um, you know, damaging our environment, supporting war criminals, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Th there is no difference morally or ethically. If you create technology that helps uh, surveillance, that technology will be used by dictators who will use it to tell their death squads and torture chambers who to grab um, for daring to uh, do opposition. Um, you think they're not uh, either selling or leaking this technology to mm, the the dictatorship in in Myanmar, uh, or uh, or even you know the Chinese government or uh, North Korea or Saudi Arabia or any of these places where dissidents are um, oppressed or and or hunted down. Uh, as a technologist, you need to consider the moral implications of your actions and working for surveillance companies is morally abhorrent. I may have lost friends at these companies by saying these things. I once had a conversation with one of the CEOs of the company after saying pretty much what I just said on stage at a conference that was sponsored by one of these companies. And their CEO came up to me afterwards and said, you know, this is this is risking the lives of our employees. <laughs> it's like you, you are in the business of risking the lives of millions of, of people in, in authoritarian countries. Are you kidding me? Um, and it's not risking the, li the lives of your employees to point out that, uh, that working for you is an act of moral bankruptcy. And that if I see someone whose resume includes working for one of your companies, I will not hire that person um, because uh, that is, in my opinion, a great demonstration of moral bankruptcy. In fact, we should use the same rules as financial bankruptcy. If you work for one of these companies, you should be unemployable for seven years, just like you can't get a loan if you've declared bankruptcy um, for seven years. All right. Do you think lightning gossip is sustainable in the long run? I mean, the everybody knows everything model. This is a question from Giovanni. Thank you, Giovanni, um, as always, for the excellent questions. Um, well, Lightning Gossip doesn't actually uh, broadcast uh, everybody knows everything model. Um, the, the gossip protocol in the Lightning Network broadcasts the existence of channels 
and the fees of those channels. It does not broadcast the balances of those channels because that would be an everyone knows everything model and would basically reduce the Lightning Network to the scalability of Bitcoin. And you can, you can decide to limit how much gossip information you ask for and receive. And you can also limit the, the frequency by which you participate in gossip or send gossip out. Uh, so these are highly tunable functions. And um, yeah, I, I don't think it's a problem. It, it, is, it is sustainable. Um, you know, at the moment, we've, we've got advertising of 55,000 channels with, with updates when the fees change. Um, and it's certainly sustainable with not too much bandwidth use. Uh, and I, I don't see it as being a problem, even if we were looking at 10 or 100 times the number of channels, because, um, you know, we, we can also implement various optimizations um, and... Uh, various mechanisms to reduce the load of of gossip. Uh, right now, it's a fairly inefficient system in that we just um, gossip everything. Um, but th that's not necessary in order to do routing. It's not necessary uh, to have it be uh, kind of the dumb dumbest possible way. It hasn't been optimized because it doesn't need to be optimized. And when it does need to be optimized, it can be optimized. Uh, and there's a lot of things we can do for um, optimization of gossip, including outsourcing some of the routing functions to various uh, um, other layer networks and then paying a lightning fee to, to get path information. Um, there, there are some trade-offs with privacy, but uh, you know there's all kinds of solutions here. We'll see. All right, let me uh, jump into the chat and see how things are going. Oh yeah, we're overdue for an emoji storm. Um, so for those of you who don't know, um, our channel has a bunch of custom emojis. We started with six, but then the more people joined as members, the more uh, custom emojis we can create. And we've been adding them to the point where really it's, it's getting difficult to come up with ideas of new emojis. But uh, one of the things we do on a fairly regular basis is uh, what we call an emoji storm, where some of the members on the channel demonstrate all of the special emojis um by blasting them on the chat as you can see right now oh thank you now there's only 25 people in this channel but don't don't forget the chat remains after the video is done so people will get to see it um synchronize with the video at this exact time The Swiss Road to Crypto asks, in Lightning, where do I set the penalty to be paid if someone tries to cheat and close a channel and present a previous state of the channel? Where does one set the time for the HTLC? Are you afraid that the Lightning network will end up centralized? Well, that's three questions in one. So let me go one by one. First of all, the penalty paid if someone tries to cheat is their balance of the channel. So basically, um, the penalty transaction gives the entire balance of the channel to the person who um, was cheated or was attempted to be cheated. So if you and I have a, a channel, Swiss Road, and um, we have whatever the capacity of the channel that was created at funding, and let's say I own 80% uh, of the balance and you own 20% of that balance and then I try to cheat, well, you get to keep 100% of it. You take my share of the funds that are in the channel. That's the penalty. It's not settable. It's always basically um, the cheated one takes everything, takes everything that's in the channel. And the channel capacity, the everything part, is set when you fund the channel in the beginning. So whatever the size of the channel is when you first create it, that's the amount that goes to um, whoever issues the penalty transaction, whoever um, uh, there was an attempt to cheat against. Um, where does one set the time for the HTLC? Um, yeah, you can set HTLC expiry times uh, in the configuration of your node, and it is something that is negotiated 
at the beginning of the channel. So when uh, two two partners attempt to create a channel, um, they negotiate the HTLC delta, as it's known, which is how much additional time delay you want on each of the HTLCs that flow through your channel. Um, and that's negotiated. In fact, that's one of the things that is being broadcast by the gossip protocol in the channel updates, because that's uh, one of the factors that goes into constructing a route. You have to know how much additional lock time delta delay to add to each hop uh, when you're constructing a route. So you can set that in your node, and your node will then advertise it, negotiate it, uh, and publish it with all of its channels. Am I afraid that the Lightning Network will end up centralized? Well, parts of the Lightning Network are centralized. Parts of the Lightning Network are not centralized. And uh, several different topologies exist in parallel. There's parts of it that are very meshed-like. Uh, uh, there's parts of it that are very hub and spoke-like. Um, and the, the centrality of the network changes over time. I think the more broadly it's used and the easier it gets, uh, the less we'll see uh, elements of centralization. So it doesn't have to be 100% decentralized to be um, powerful, empowering, useful, freeing um, for those who use it. Um, it just has to have the option for those who want to use it in a more decentralized way to do so, and it does. And so several different topologies will emerge and coexist um, on the Lightning Network. I think in the long run, decentralization is a battle that you have to keep fighting. And uh, over time, networks become more and more centralized unless something disruptive happens. Look at the internet, for example. You know, when the internet started, it was extremely flat uh, and very decentralized. Nowadays, it is highly centralized, both in, in the routing layer and the IP layer. Uh, but even more so in the content and content distribution layer, um, e even in the identity layer. So uh, several aspects of the internet have become very, very, very centralized. Um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't aspects of the internet that are also very decentralized and that give the rise to other more decentralized protocols. We just have to keep fighting this battle. We have to keep fighting it with disruptive technology. All right, let me tell you about some of the things we've done recently. The first one is, I'm very excited about this, um, the very, very popular uh, course, Introduction to Bitcoin and Open Blockchains, that has been, um, that has been uh, subscribed and taken by, I think about 2,500 people have taken this course so far um, in English. And now uh, we have it available in Spanish. And so this is uh, with subtitles for the videos, but all of the rest of the course materials are translated, um, including the quizzes, the tests, and the certificate at the end. We've got, I've had a couple hundred people sign up for the Spanish language one. Uh, you know, there isn't that much quality education, especially the education that comes with, you know, some uh, proof that you completed it and a certificate of, at least of accomplishment and some real... Uh, quizzes that go with that. So I'm very happy that we were able to make that available in Spanish. This is the beginning and not the end. We will do more workshops in Spanish and I'm looking forward to those too. And um, you'll find that in the workshop section of the shop on my website where you'll also find uh, everything from eBooks uh, across a very broad range of eBooks, including eBooks in multiple languages. Um, and open format ebooks that have no digital rights management protections and give you multiple formats like PDF, EPUB, and Kindle compatible formats. But you'll also find silly things like Christmas ornaments and t-shirts and um, all kinds of other silly little products we make from time to time um, that allow you to express something about uh, Bitcoin or open blockchains. Um, so that you can be that annoying person in your family uh, who keeps talking about these things. And we even have some t-shirts that say, uh, that have slogans like, um, 
am I the only one at this party who wants to talk about Bitcoin and <laughs> things like that. So little fun products if you want to do. Now, uh, keep in mind, shipping is not really going to be possible for the holidays at this point if you buy something physical. However, uh, eBooks, workshops, and other digital um, stuff is still available. I believe today might be the last day um, for the uh, holiday 21, 21% discount on all uh, digital products. So eBooks, workshops um, are all 21% off if you enter the code HOLIDAY21, one word, as a coupon in checkout. So, you know, if you want to buy something silly, um, or if you want to buy some education, uh, now's the time. Here's another great question about the Lightning Network. This one comes from Zikas. If we use the Lightning Network as intended, very often small transactions, the accounting required for tax reports becomes next to impossible. Are there any wallets that prepare those reports for us, or are we facing a tough decision here? Uh, we're facing a tough decision. Now, Zikas, keep in mind, this kind of capital gains reporting isn't universal. This is a particular feature of the American tax system. So if you use the Lightning Network in the United States and you use it to do a whole bunch of microtransactions and the United States doesn't change its de minimis exception, which does not exist for Bitcoin uh, and other cryptocurrencies, then uh, yes, you will create an accounting nightmare. You'll be trying to produce thousands of pages of reports for the IRS in order to account for one penny transactions with zero gain um, to pay, you know, a buck in taxes at the end of the year. It's ridiculous. Um, possibly intentional. Uh, certainly many people think so, uh, myself included. But uh, yeah, it is a tough decision. If you are a United States citizen, if you're using Lightning, with thousands of transactions, you're going to create an accounting nightmare for yourself. All right, and uh, let's do one last, uh, two last questions, and then um, we'll take a little break for about 30 minutes, and then uh, those of you who are patrons can meet us in the VR holiday party, um, with or without VR and uh, join me for a little chat afterwards. Philip asks, comparing non-Turing complete smart contract blockchains with Turing complete virtual machine blockchains, do you prefer agility, playfulness, and innovation or rock solid but limited function sets? Well, Philip, it depends what I'm trying to do. Um, for my retirement savings, uh, for my... Um, for my uh, rock solid funds, I want rock solid but limited function sets. Um, but uh, in terms of some of my more speculative investments, uh, some of the things I want to do at an application level, in terms of the things that I might want to spend time doing software development, uh, then agility, playfulness, and innovation certainly win the game. And we've seen that split occur uh, in the in the open blockchain space uh, between those two categories. All right, I think we have a part two to this question, which is the next question. Let's, let's see. Is that the next question we're gonna do? No, okay. So, um, so yeah, as with many questions in, uh, that come up in our industry, um, you have to ask a follow-up question is, do you prefer X or Y? And my follow-up question is, for what purpose? For what application? For what use case? There is no one thing that solves everything for everyone, everywhere, all the time. And if you try to make something like that, uh, it, will, it will fail to satisfy anyone. Um, that, that's like um, an, an unopinionated uh trying to do everything and please everyone system, it's not going to work. Uh, it's not going to help anyone do anything in any way. So I think it's, uh, it's actually a good thing to have a degree of specialization 
and um, ask the question for what application. Nikolai asks, you once said accessing your private keys were protected by armed guards and required biometric scans and an identity check to access. How can I do this too? Well, this is the irony of it, that um, the people who are really good at doing all of the above, um, guards, bars, dogs, biometrics, and identity checks, are banks, physical banks. Also, um, various uh, private uh, safe deposit and depository uh, institutions, uh, which are not affiliated with banks. Um, and many countries have these types of institutions with or without uh, various legal guarantees as to the ownership and control of access and what happens to the safe deposit boxes, but basically a safe deposit box is a worthwhile investment because then you can buy the physical security, the physical security of this being inside a vault, inside a facility that has and is protecting the wealth of others. Um, yours may be digital keys, but uh, presumably other safe deposit boxes in those same institutions contain various physical commodities, gold, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, you could do something in the digital realm uh, using multi-sig, using uh, time locks, using things like that. However, um, there's a lot of risk with trying uh, various non-standard technological solutions on platforms that are, you know, not yet very mature. Especially if you want to consider the fact that if something happens to you, you want your money to be inherited by your family. And so sometimes the, the traditional, the physical, the simple solution um, is better suited. The safe deposit box is better than the super complex smart contract. All right, and uh, let's do one, one more question. Anonymous asks, with mainstream adoption of Bitcoin imminent, do you fear, fear that the core philosophical principles of Bitcoin will be lost or threatened as more fiat era participants enter the space and exceed 50% of philosophically bounded Bitcoin users? I mean, this is inevitable. This happens with every system. The early adopters are the purest, the ideologically driven, the philosophically driven. And then as you get more and more and more mainstream, the fundamental principles get diluted. Um, the question is, can the system itself survive dilution of the principles by those who hold it or use it? Uh, and that's a question I don't know the answer to. We'll see. I think Bitcoin has a better chance of surviving with many of its principles intact because it has certain aspects, certain characteristics that are self-reinforcing, that are um, dynamically adjusting, that are stable, that align incentives with outcomes, that are basically well-designed from a game theory perspective so that uh, self-interested users of the system will uh, safeguard those principles uh, because they align with their own interests, even if it goes mainstream rapidly. Um, the conversation in the media is going to look very different, and I think we've already seen that. Uh, already, the conversation that we see around these technologies has very much departed the philosophical principles uh, of the early days. And it's, it's sometimes very disappointing to see that. But, um, but that hasn't changed the system itself. Uh, they're trying hard to change it, but so far they're not succeeding. So I'm optimistic about this. I'm optimistic that the system is stable enough that for at least some time we'll be able to resist uh, the erosion of its principles, in fact, uh, even if those principles have disappeared from the discussion, they're still maintained by a dynamic, uh, by a dynamic system that adjusts. All right, let's see what else we're doing here.
I think that's all. That's all for today. Listen, we have a lot of big plans for 2022. The mission hasn't changed. It's the same basic mission. Educate as many people as possible in as many languages as possible about Bitcoin and open blockchains and the historical, philosophical, societal, economic implications and impacts of these amazing technologies as they evolve um, in a way that's that's neutral, that's not driven by sponsorships or corporate interests or anything like that. It's just basically an honest opinion that comes from study, research, expertise, and the support of uh, a community that, that gives me the freedom to continue to do this education. I'm going to keep doing it in 2022. My team is going to keep doing it in 2022. Uh, we've got a lot of plans uh, to continue to produce more languages, more content, uh, more material, more education. Um, and it's thanks to your support. So thank you for sticking around with me. And I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful holiday season with your family. And I will see you next year unless you're a patron, in which case I'll see you in 30 minutes. Hey! Hi, I'm Andreas Antonopoulos. If you enjoyed that video, consider that it takes a lot of work to produce open and free content that can be shared with everyone around the world. This isn't sponsored by some company, it's not promoting a product or an altcoin, or some kind of investment scheme. My goal is simply to help explain the technology of Bitcoin and open blockchains to as many people as possible in a neutral way that focuses really on the incredible possibilities that this technology brings us. If you'd like to support that mission, subscribe to my channel and go on patreon.com slash aantonop, where you can participate and help me build better content for more people. Thank you.